and welcome to our webinar, uh, part of the four-part series, the ATI Basics, Fundamentals of in Alternatives to Incarceration. I'm here with my colleagues. Well, I'm Michelle Warbeck, Global, Global Lead for ICADI, the International Consortium for Alternatives to Incarceration. And I'm here with my colleagues, Melody Heaps, who's our Senior Consultant for Strategic Planning, Roger Peters, who is our Research and Evaluation Consultant, and Jack Charlier, who is our technical um, expert consultant. We're also here as, uh, with our co-host, uh, ISEP. ISEP and ICADI are working together on this four-part series. ISEP is a membership organization with over 20,000 members worldwide, working in the fields of substance use, prevention, treatment, and recovery care. ICADI is a global network supporting the development of treatment care and accountability as alternatives to incarceration. We work with countries, organizations, professionals, and program sites to support the global development of treatment care and accountability as alternatives to incarceration, and we uh, collaborate with international organizations and experts to create initiatives that can be adapted for your country. As I mentioned, this is part of a four-part series, and we will also follow today's webinar which is uh, not participatory with networking conversations. So at the end of the presentation, I will show you some links and we'll have full one hour discussions so we can all learn more about how these fundamentals of ATI apply to you in your country. One other announcement, if you check the chat box, um, we are offering Spanish interpretation today and um, we we'll just direct you to the chat box to understand how to link with that. So with those introductions, I know uh, we have a tight timeline. I'm going to start the presentation and you'll see colleagues come um, back on camera when it is their turn to present. Uh, Marie, if you would go to the next slide. If you came to our first webinar series, Why ATI? We talked a lot about the reasons supporting the justification and really the compelling reasons to use ATI rather than incarceration. I wanted to review a few of those um, reasons and also some of the facts supporting them. So we see now that 296 million people across the world have used drugs according to the latest uh, World Drug Report. It's a full 6% of our population and 40 million people that have used drugs actually have a clinical drug use disorder. And you can see from this slide, the collateral consequences of drug use go well beyond the substance use disorders. We have health conditions, uh, of which one is the substance use disorder. There are implications for employment. Um, we have death, suicide, and injuries from accidents. There are also increased risk for crime and violence, and high costs related to the cost of incarceration, financial as well as human rights, and the increase in recidivism. Next slide. I wanted to share with you for a minute an appreciation of the number of people that have come into contact with the justice system for two potential drug-related issues. One would be trafficking and the other for possession, personal possession of drugs. And unfortunately, when we look at the number of people that are initially arrested for either of those two crimes, um, the vast majority, 61%, are actually those who have personal possession of drugs. You see that percentage decreases when we look at rate of conviction and also for sentencing, but we still have 470,000 people in prison for personal possession alone, which is about 22% um, of our prison population. Uh, actually, not population, but population related to these offenses. Next slide. It's not just possession and trafficking that brings people into the justice system. Uh, we know from data that 60% of people that are arrested test positive for a substance at the time of arrest. 62% of those arrested have not received any treatment for substance use disorders. And when we look at the people that we are housing in our corrections facilities, 63% do have a clinical substance use disorder. Next. Uh, one question arises, have uh, these individuals received any treatment? So when we look at lifetime treatment history among people who were arrested, 62% haven't received any treatment at all. 
Just over a little over a fourth of the people have received some substance use treatment. Mental health is at 4% and combined SUD and mental health is only 7%. When they're in our justice system, only 10% of people receive treatment. And we're already on our next slide, so go ahead and start the animation again. I'm not going to be able to read all of these uh, for those that are using translation, um, but we are showing here a list of all the other human implications of incarceration, um, even for minor and nonviolent offenses. And so you can see that it impacts families with loss of uh, child custody. It can cause evictions when you disrupt employment. Um, it may cause ineligibility for um, foster care or family supports. It limits or eliminates job opportunities. It uh, has a disparate impact on depressed neighborhoods that are relying upon that person to be there with their family and to raise income. And it causes a huge degree of instability among many other collateral consequences on this slide. Next slide. The um, results of imprisonment, if we are relying upon punishment to address substance use disorders, um, this slide shows that it's not very successful. So within three years of release from a correction setting, the recidivism rate, um, the likelihood of coming back into contact with the justice system and be rearrested is um, 68%. And of that, 52% actually return to prison and serve time for a new crime. So this is clearly not the result that we're looking for. And this is the opportunity that our current justice approach, if we are using merely incarceration and nothing else related to substance use disorders, um, this is the opportunity for us to make improvements on that. I'd now like to turn uh, the webinar over to my colleague, Melody Heaps. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you and thank you for joining us and for inquiring about what we mean by alternatives to incarceration. And I like us to think about the justice system with regard to substance use disorder involvement as kind of a subway map or a bus or train um, series of exits and, enters and entries, that we have uh, a system where we embark on the train, we get on the train at point A when we are involved with regard to a substance use disorder or an, an individual involved or perhaps over, overdosing or whatever, and law enforcement it begins to intervene with them. And then we can move that individual into the prosecutorial stage, into the court stage, and on. At each point, however, of the justice system, of this train route, is an exit. And that exit often occurs when individuals are arrested. And if it's the first time, they may indeed be put out at the first or second exit. But the strange thing about this train is that the more times you embark at station A at the beginning, the least amount of exits there will be. So that when you've heard from Michelle that essentially 68% of individuals who enter the justice system with substance use disorders end up recidivating, committing other crimes, to which all, almost 52% end up in prison. And that's because we close down the exits. The more that people leave the justice system with no treatment intervention, the further, when they are rearrested again, the further they will go along on that train system until we have embarked on an express train that ends up in custodial settings in jails or prisons. Only then to be released, persons coming back into the community and trying to get on that train again. And so the point is that we need to create and blend and integrate the public health system working with the justice system to intervene in this insane cycle of arrest, incarceration, release, arrest. It's kind of like being on a merry-go-round or a Ferris wheel. And the way we intervene is by stationing what I call treatment guides at these exit points. People who have understandings of treatment, who are clinicians, who can guide an individual into a treatment plan, into treatment, and into their recovery process. And in so doing, we can prevent that person from recycling back into the justice system. 
so that indeed we can reduce the recidivism, reduce the criminality, promote public health. Again, see this as a mechanism by which we close down point A for reembarkation for people who go to treatment. They don't want to get on that train anymore. And we reduce the cost, the enormous cost, of constantly incarcerating, putting people through the justice system, the cost in terms of danger to the community, disruption of families, and also danger and potentially overdose deaths of individuals involved with substance use disorders. So alternatives to incarceration is in fact a mechanism by which we can work with the public health treatment system to develop a partnership that moves people into treatment instead of further progressing into the, the penalties of the justice system and inev inevitably into incarceration or custodial settings. And to that end, we would hope that countries would look at the need to develop a system that has indeed all of these opportunities at the potential exit points. But we might not be able to do that all at once. You may decide to focus on one part of the system and use that as an example to the community of how successful it would be to in reducing crime and reducing substance use and then moving to other parts of the system that would allow individuals to access treatment. And so I'm hoping you'll use the information that you're getting today to think about what your needs are, what the critical components are, what the critical issues are with regard to your justice system, and begin to think about how you can build and integrate your public health system into serving individuals with substance use disorders who indeed are in contact and moving through the justice system. Thank you. And with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Roger Peters, who will talk to you more about the population and about why this is such a good idea. Roger. Great, and thank you, Melody. Uh, let's look at the science and research then related to treatment alternatives to incarceration. And just returning to the idea of the high prevalence rates of substance use disorders internationally, we look at both alcohol and drug use disorders, and we can see that the rates of these disorders are highly magnified and increased in the criminal justice system for both alcohol use disorders and drug use disorders, and much higher than the general population. So, and this is true in every country that, that uh, we work with. And if you look at the gender differences between men and women, not huge differences with alcohol use disorders, but when we look at drug use disorders at the bottom of the slide, we can see that the rates are significantly higher for women in the criminal justice system. So more than half of women have a diagnosable drug use disorder in the justice system at each of the different stages that Melody just mentioned. So a really important issue for us to provide treatment in these settings to uh, interrupt the cycle of people coming back into the justice system who have substance use disorders. Let's go to the next slide. So we have the majority of people in the justice system who have used drugs and alcohol. Many of them are in need of treatment, of course, but not all of these individuals need intensive drug treatment or even a treatment program at all. Some can just benefit from a drug education or other type of support services. One thing to note is that it can be actually harmful to place persons who have a mild substance use disorder into an intensive drug treatment program. They don't belong there. They, they can benefit from other types of services like employment, uh, rehabilitation services, uh, reentry services as well. But they're exposed in many cases to people with high criminality and who have severe drug problems, which can lead them into uh, uh, criminality themselves. And so we have to be very careful about who we place in our treatment programs within the justice system. This also emphasizes the need for effective screening for persons in the justice system to identify those who have 
diagnosable substance use disorders and are the best candidates for alternatives to incarceration that involve treatment. So as we move down this slide, we look at just the importance of prioritizing, as we mentioned, to identify people who are the best candidates for drug treatment who have a significant and diagnosable substance use disorder and also high levels of, of criminality. This last point, we'll get to this model later on. I won't explain it in detail right now, but there is a model that can help us to prioritize how we allocate drug treatment services in the justice system to prioritize those who can most benefit and can lead to better outcomes for our programs. Next. So very briefly, the research shows that we can have very good results with substance use treatment in the justice system across different types of outcomes that are relevant and important to us. Substance use, certainly reductions in substance use while people are in outpatient programs in the community. Reductions in crime, very significant reductions across different types of programs that are alternatives to incarceration. One example, research with drug courts indicates that we can have sustained reductions in arrest for up, uh, 15 years or more if people are involved in alternative to incarceration programs. So that's a really significant figure. And so our programs are, are very effective at reducing crime. Also increasing employment, which is very important for reentry for people in incarceration or who are in intensive treatment, uh, getting job skills and full-time or part-time employment. So very good outcomes uh, across the alternative to incarceration programs. Let's look at another outcome on the next slide. So we also know that we can save money by introducing, implementing effective alternative to incarceration programs. The research shows that for every dollar we spend on treatment in these programs, we get about $18 return to society. And this is in the form of reduced crime, reduced incarceration, uh, two of the biggest factors leading to cost savings and benefits. Also, as we mentioned before, increased employment, people who are paying their taxes instead of sitting in prison, uh, also reduced healthcare expenses related to hospitalization. One thing to note is that some of the biggest savings are related to not having to build new prisons to house people who have drug-related problems. And so if we can shift these people into community treatment settings, we can forego the need to build very expensive short and long-term detention facilities. And so finally, we look at the comparison between treatment in the community versus incarceration, either short or long-term incarceration. And the costs are really five times higher in most settings than providing community drug treatment. So not only do we get cost benefits to society, we also have cost savings related to the comparison of providing <coughs> drug treatment in the community. Next slide. One thing I wanna share with you, and you may not know this already, uh, it's important to have a combination of community supervision for people who have drug problems in the justice system, but also to include in that uh, in that combination, uh, treatment, particularly intensive treatment for this population. So if you look at this chart, you can see that supervision alone leads to no changes in the rates of rearrest or recidivism for adult offenders. When you add employment, you get some decreases in the risk for rearrest. When you add drug treatment alone, you provide a additional boost to the reductions in rearrest. But look at the right-hand side. When you combine intensive supervision with effective drug treatment, for example, in an alternative to incarceration program, you get the maximum benefits in terms of reduced rearrest. 
So we'll go to the next slide. I won't spend much time on this slide, but I think the, the, the slide here shows that we have a lot of different options for alternative to incarceration programs to consider that involve treatment. And it could be case management or outreach for people who are involved in the programs who are community-based treatment participants. We talked about screening and the need for effective screening to identify people who are good candidates for the best outcomes in our alternatives to incarceration programs. Most of the alternative to incarceration programs worldwide are provided in an outpatient treatment setting that gives you the best cost benefits, the best outcomes for your alternative to incarceration programs. Uh, we also do need to have some capacity for residential treatment, whether that's short term or longer term for people that may be relapsing, experiencing risk for overdose or overdose itself. Uh, and then finally, the need for aftercare and recovery management uh, in the community. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And that I believe that aftercare is very important, not only for people who are placed in intensive treatment in the community, but certainly also for people who are in short and long-term detention in prison, for example, who desperately need to have a continuum of care and support after they leave prison, which is in the first few months is the highest risk for relapse, recidivism, and overdose. We'll go to the next slide. So here we are talking about returning to the risk need responsivity model. Part of this model, which we won't go into detail today, but part of the model indicates that you need to focus your services and activities in treatment alternatives to incarceration on the areas that lead to rearrest. And so if you look at this chart, all of these bullets are independent risk factors for rearrest for people in the justice system. And if you can address each of these in your treatment programs that are alternatives to incarceration, you can incrementally decrease the chances for rearrest for the participants in the program. And you notice here that, of course, substance use and substance use treatment is an important factor in reducing rearrest, as well as some of these other areas that sometimes get neglected in our treatment programs. Let's go to the next slide, which also talks about the risk need responsibility model. And again, the model shows us that we actually have improved outcomes in our ATI programs if we focus on people who have moderate to high risk for arrest. And so these are individuals, for example, that have a, a longer history of criminal involvement and a number of other risk factors for rearrest. And so there are screening instruments and assessment instruments to actually identify the risk level for people who <clears throat> are being considered for participation in alternatives to incarceration programs. But the bottom line and the important summary is that we have the best reductions in arrest if we treat people that have moderate to high criminal risk. And again, this maximizes the cost savings of our programs because if you take people with only mild and casual drug use, the outcomes aren't going to be much different in an intensive drug treatment program than they might be if you just put somebody in a work release program or a drug education program. You're not going to see any reduced recidivism or rearrest because they're not at high risk for rearrest anyway. Does that make sense? And so we have a better set of outcomes in our alternative to incarceration programs if we can focus our treatment and other supervision services on people who come into the program with a higher criminal risk. Uh, as we notice here, again, low-risk individuals don't need intensive treatment. They can actually be harmed by being placed with other uh, higher-level criminals in these programs. Um, 
And then mixing people with different risk levels is uh, really something to be avoided. So again, the need for screening for criminal risk is an important factor. We'll go to the next slide and we'll wrap up in just a minute. So I wanna share with you that drug treatment as an alternative to incarceration also needs to address special needs of the participants. If you look at this set of areas here on the slide, what I would like to share with you is that any of these can undermine involvement in evidence-based drug treatment if they're not addressed. And so, for example, if you have somebody who's homeless out on the street, that's gonna be a very difficult person to engage in an alternative to incarceration treatment program, right? Uh, similarly, for people with untreated psychosis or bipolar disorder or major depression, these mental disorders can interfere very significantly with their involvement in a drug treatment program as an alternative to incarceration. So we need to consider these factors as we build our treatment programs that are part of the alternative to incarceration programs that were uh, created. Uh, finally, the last thing I'd like to share with you is just the importance again of mental disorders in, can we go to the next slide please? Thank you. Just wanted to share with you the importance again of mental disorders and including mental health in our programs for alternatives to incarceration. If you look at this slide, you'll just see the very high rates of major mental disorders in the justice system as compared with the general population, which is here on the left side of the screen. So really six times the rates of major mental disorders in short and long-term detention settings. Uh, what you don't see here is the, the blue slide uh, relates to females, the yellow slide relates to males, and you can see the rates of mental disorders are significantly higher for females in these settings, uh, including post-traumatic stress disorder and history of violence uh, that uh, contributes to that. So again, the need to, to really address uh, mental disorders as part of our drug treatment programs incorporated in the alternative to incarceration programs that we build. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over at this point to Michelle. Thanks, Roger. And if we could have the next slide. As you can see and what we've learned from colleagues is that this is a practice that actually has been existing for decades. It's based upon data and evidence and science. And now I wanna talk a little bit about some key building blocks that if you were to do ATI in your country, you would need to employ these building blocks and adapt them um, as needed to your particular situations. So the first building block that we would look at is making sure that three main systems are all engaged in your ATI approach. The justice system is going to be encountering individuals and it's really the first opportunity to identify someone that has a treatment need that should be included as part of the approach. So they're going to look at both clinical um, and legal criteria, as well as um, risk for recidivism and other factors that we just learned about. And they'll rely closely on treatment providers, the treatment um, system, to identify those clinical needs and to provide full, robust clinical assessments. Based upon the combined information, they can determine eligibility for the initiative that you are offering. And as needed, they can continue to have supervision of the case. And we'll see in a later slide where that applies and where that might not be necessary. And also accountability to continue to engage that person in the program and ensure public safety. The treatment system, as I mentioned, is key in providing that clinical robust information that we have already learned about. Um, the treatment program or treatment system also needs to address all of the levels of care and the progression through levels of care that are needed as a part of ATI and ensuring that all the care needs are met. The behavioral health and SUD treatment, any medical conditions that are existing 
and also offering the appropriate medications and pharmacological responses. And we've seen both in the collateral consequences uh, for incarceration, as well as maybe some of the factors that are predisposing people to encounter the justice system, that the social services system is key to the success of someone entering into these initiatives. So there are skills that are needed both in how people think about their responses to situations and also basic life skills. And there's an opportunity to identify and uh, build upon the protective factors that will support long-term recovery, that will help prevent further drug use, and will also reduce some of the risks of recidivism. Next slide. So once you have all three systems involved, you need a way of caring for and coordinating all of these services. And so case care management is a system that supports your ATI initiative. Um, the case care manager will ensure that the information required by the justice system, the transfer of information from the health system to the justice system, and also those community and social supports are well coordinated. They'll wrap around the individual and focus on that individual's strengths and needs. They can help prioritize services, develop service plans, engage clients directly with services, and monitor their progress, um, advocating uh, within these systems the responses that are needed. So if a client is not able to meet all of the justice expectations, oftentimes there's a service adjustment that's required. And so the case care management system can help identify where those adjustments are needed, advocate that that is the approach that is used, and engage with the systems that are going to be providing the services that are needed. So we have three systems, the health, the justice, um, and the community service systems, and we have a robust um, system of case care management to hold everything together. Next slide. We heard about the risk need responsivity model. So we're looking at clinical need for treatment, the likelihood that someone will re-engage in the justice system, and also some of those protective factors that need to be bolstered for someone's success. So when you take that model and you put it onto a four-part grid, we see different um, individual needs that should drive the type of ATI initiative that would be most effective for that individual. Uh, Dr. Roger Peters um, talked a little bit about the drug court space or the drug treatment court. That focus is on the individual with the most need. They have a moderate to high risk for recidivism. They also have a high or moderate need for treatment. And they're going to require all of the different services that I referenced. They're going to need some ongoing justice supervision. They'll need several levels of treatment, probably starting off in more intensive treatment and then stepping down to lesser levels as they progress, they'll need some of those thinking strategies as well as life skills, and we'll need to bolster protective factors. And we'll learn a little bit more about that model in a bit, but that tends to be more structured and a more long-term program. At the opposite end um, of the quadrant, you can look at the lower right-hand square. That's where if someone has a low need for treatment, and really a low risk for recidivism, we would identify the degree to which substances are being used and most likely use a prevention, um, evidence prevention strategies that would, uh, that would discourage um, any further use of substances so that we don't develop a substance use disorder and also have a factor or focus on those protective factors. At the upper right-hand quadrant, where we have a low risk for recidivism, so not likely to re-enter the justice system, but definitely a moderate to high need for treatment, that is going to focus much more on treatment, on any life skills that are needed, and protective factors. And where there might be some risks for recidivism that would benefit from these thinking strategies, we would use those, but really only as needed. And then the lower left-hand quadrant, low need for treatment, high risk for recidivism, those are the more traditional justice cases that are going to have a um, higher focus on supervision and those thinking strategies, and again, only using treatment and other approaches as appropriate. 
Next uh, slide, please. The last building block, if you will, that we want to look at is making sure that we engage the full justice continuum. Oftentimes when we hear people talk about ATI, it's a lot about the courts and the judges. And so here we wanna make sure that we realize that the first opportunity to engage someone and to prevent engagement in the court system at all is through our pre-arrest uh, deflection efforts with police and first responders. Then we move into the court process with prosecutors making another series of decisions where they can have sort of the justice system as usual, or they can have the ATI approach that would be appropriate for the individual. We then do move on to judges and courts as we get deeper into the justice system. And even if there's a conviction, we can look at opportunities to have community supervision instead of incarceration, or if there is a need for incarceration. And at times we have violent crimes, we have community safety needs, we have serious crimes where punishment is required, then we do need to address those treatment and clinical needs upon reentry into the community. So as we heard from Melody, that person doesn't cycle back into the justice system and they can fully reintegrate into community. So at this point, we're gonna take the next section of our webinar and give you some examples of how these systems look. And I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Jack Charlier, for um, an explanation of deflection. Thank you, Michelle, and greetings to everybody. It is a pleasure to have you all with us wherever you might be today. I will, as Michelle said, talk to you a little bit about the left-hand side of the subway map, as you've heard in reference, where it says pre-arrest. Now, when we think about uh, this early stage uh, of the subway continuum of the map, and I'm gonna say next slide, because I think there's an animation that's gonna come in here. When we uh, think about this space, uh, compared to the other spaces of courts, of uh, prisons, of prosecution, of jails, if your uh, country has jails, of reentry, um, really this front end space where police uh, have acted pre-arrest, uh, this role for police has not been clear. We're not quite sure uh, what it is that we want to do with it in terms of ATI and alternatives to incarceration. We know overall, of course, the justice system can divert many people using community-based resources, but what's the role of police in ATI? Next slide. And so, yep. I'm gonna introduce you to a word and that word is deflection. Deflection gives us now an understanding of how do police get involved in alternative incarceration. The other segments that uh, Michelle and Melody and Roger talked about, those are fairly clear when we think of courts and prisons, but what about police? And so this idea of deflection introduces the concept that when we think about the police and alternatives to incarceration, what we really mean is we're not waiting for nor needing an arrest, a crisis, an overdose, a situation or an event. Historically, the role of police has been wait for the arrest, there's an arrest, enter the person into the justice system. But because we're talking alternatives to incarceration, the police need a different role. And that different role, again, is called deflection, which is probably a new word for some of you. For others, it's not. Uh, but it is the way to think about how your nation's police can be involved in ATI. So not waiting for nor needing those items that I said. Uh, next. And instead, deflection, next, uh, gives us an early upstream strategy. Deflection is prevention and deflection is meeting people where they are. In other words, instead of thinking of police as the mechanism for arrest, which is certainly part of their role, think of police as also people who encounter on the streets, people are using drugs at various states of drug use, uh, maybe just very early on, there's certainly not addiction set in, kind of the misuse stage uh, where things are kind of on their way to possibly getting bad, and certainly where uh, we have full addiction in play and all the things that go with it. Next. Yep. Another way to uh, think about deflection, and this is really just a visual of what I have been using words for so far, is deflection creates new opportunities to reduce drug use and drug crime that we did not think of before. What you see on the screen from left to right is the subway map but in a different form. Everything on the right-hand side of your screen, those four yellow ovals, is everything that you saw um, that was in the space of courts and prisons and jails and prosecutors 
and probation and parole if your country has all that. Um, and that's what we call diversion. But the left-hand side is where we want to focus our pre-arrest work of ATI, our deflection work with police of uh, ATI. Next. And what we want to think about in this space is, again, the use of community-based services, housing, and recovery, very similar to the rest of ATI, but in a way that allows people to be deflected without actually entering the justice system. That's the new piece. They will not enter the justice system. Instead, they're able to stay in community and be safely deflected. Next slide. So when we then understand deflection and we get and know how the role of police can be used in a way for alternatives to incarceration, can be used in a way for drug demand reduction, instead of just thinking of the police as an enforcement mechanism or as a suppression mechanism, then deflection shows how police can be part of ATI. That's called the pre-arrest segment on the very left-hand side of your screen. Next slide. Finally, uh, before I turn it back over to Michelle, what you see here then in a community, notice everything we're talking about here in this pre-arrest, this deflection space occurs in community, is what we're really doing is we're creating a bridge, a br bridge between law enforcement on the left-hand side and drug treatment on the right-hand side of the bridge. Two uh, entities, two systems that really don't have a good history together uh, and don't have a lot of history together. But through the use of deflection introduced for the pre-arrest stage of ATI, we are now building these relationships between organizations and systems to do this front end work, not having to wait for an arrest, uh, as we said earlier. This also is the way to think about linking public safety and public health, as well as supply reduction. Next supply reduction and drug demand reduction. Next. And finally, just to close this out before I turn it back over to Michelle, uh, what deflection is doing then for your nation's police is it would create a third option for them. Next. And that third option would be instead of arresting, which of course the police need to do at times, there's no argument on that, instead of taking no action, which means that they see situations where they could act in terms of helping people get them into treatment, but they don't know what to do because they don't have deflection, they don't have the pre-arrest stage of ATI built in, but when they do, they can instead now deflect. Next. And deflection then opens up this opportunity for something new in terms of how we respond to drug use in a community setting under alternatives to incarceration. Next, and with that then I will turn it back over to Michelle. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate the explanation of deflection. It's when we look at the models of ATI, deflection is a newer model and it's become very popular because as Jack mentioned, we can avoid all of those collateral, consequ uh, uh, collateral consequences of being involved in the justice system through deflection. I want to quickly visit two opportunities when you're in the court space um, to look at ATI. The first is prosecutorial diversion. And if your legal system does not have prosecutors evaluating the sufficiency of legal charges and when to uh, proceed, then please adapt this language to what would be appropriate in your country. So basically prosecutors, if there is an arrest made or if there are charges filed, they have the same opportunities to consider a quick exit from the justice system as the police just considered. So if you don't have deflection, prosecutors may be the first justice um, officials that are making these decisions. Oftentimes, prosecutors will use ATI if there is um, a misdemeanor or a relatively minor nonviolent offense. They may offer programs for first-time offenders or those that clearly are in need of some treatment. I would recommend that validated screening tools be used throughout the justice system to determine whether someone would have some need for treatment as well as those risks for recidivism. Um, prosecutors would determine the conditions of referral to this type of a program. Sometimes there aren't any conditions at all. They're simply returned to those community-based services um, to be cared for as needed. Um, sometimes they will have a condition for dismissing charges, such as not committing new crimes, remaining drug or alcohol free. There may be some reporting. 
um, and making sure that the justice system understands any changes in your contact information, and they may also encourage that person to maintain or seek employment. Um, prosecutors may also consider how to make the community whole from the behavior that brought the person into the court system to begin with. So if there was any um, damage to property, there could be paying restitution or restoring that person who was damaged. If there was a victim to the crime, making sure the victim consents to ATI, but maybe even participating in a victim panel um, or some restorative justice, um, or there could be a requirement to do some community service. Again, making sure that the response is proportionate to the behavior that brought them into the justice system. And of course, the therapeutic condition. So making sure that they receive the services, both clinical and non-clinical, that are needed for success. Uh, next slide. I mentioned briefly about the drug treatment court. Um, that is an extensive model, and so we don't have time in this webinar to fully develop it, but I do want you to be alerted that there are um, adult drug court best practice standards um, that are available for you to look at and evaluate. And I can see now they're numbered instead of one through 10, we have one through five twice. So we will correct that slide. Um, but when you look at drug treatment courts, they tend to focus their target population would be people that have a high to moderate risk for recidivism and a high to moderate need for treatment. We need to be sure that those um, qualification factors allow full participation from everyone who needs that access so we don't set up barriers to participation in ATI. We address those barriers so that we can be inclusive. They um, talk about the roles and responsibilities of the judge and making sure that judges understand when we have incentives to do desired behaviors, when there are sanctions and program requirements aren't followed, and also the significant opportunity for therapeutic and service adjustment. So if there's non-compliance with the program requirement, we have a therapeutic response that will help that um, requirement be met. Of course, Dr. Roger Peters already talked about substance use disorder treatment and expectations there. And we've mentioned the complementary social services that would be monitoring to see when that person is able to stop their substance use. It's a team approach that takes care of um, all of the needs. And we um, also incorporate monitoring and evaluation components. Uh, at this point, I'm going to, with this quick overview of court-based ATI, want to turn the program back over to Roger Peters for re-entry discussion. Great, and thanks, Michelle. Uh, just to wrap up the continuum, there are also services for re-entry for persons who are either leaving a custody setting, either short or long-term detention, or who are leaving residential treatment in the community. And so uh, we've talked today a lot about placing people who have substance use disorders in community treatment settings as an alternative to incarceration, but what about people who are placed in prison or in residential treatment? What can be done to connect them to services in the community. So uh, basically, reentry services are anything that provide a bridge between either custody or residential treatment settings back to the community. Oftentimes, these involve case management services to connect community treatment with the individual who's about to be released from uh, prison or who is about to be released from residential treatment into an outpatient treatment setting. One of the things that we know is that oftentimes release from these settings is a very high risk for relapse and for recidivism or rearrest. And so we want to reduce this by having that bridge in place immediately following release from these settings so that people don't go back to their neighborhoods, their bad habits, to drug use, to involvement with criminal peers and criminal activity. So this is a very important time to provide services for people to keep the continuum of treatment uh, in place. So one thing that we know from the research is that reentry programs from short and long-term incarceration 
can significantly improve outcomes related to substance use, reduced substance use, right? A reduced risk for overdose, and also, of course, reduced risk for rearrest. In some cases, we can actually double the effects of prison treatment when we provide reentry services that provide a continuum to the community uh, involving case management in most cases. So if we look at a couple of these items on the slide, we want to provide, treat, even for people in the prison setting, in custody settings, we want to provide treatment in an isolated setting prior to release so that people don't have exposure to the general population and go back to their bad habits and ignore all of the skills and the learning that they've achieve through treatment. Uh, this is the case even for people who are not involved in a prison treatment program at all. But if we're going to provide reentry services for those who are in need of drug treatment, it's very important to keep them isolated from the general population prior to release so that they're ready and motivated for involvement in treatment after release. So uh, we mentioned before this reentry services can include, should include drug treatment, uh, housing, employment, other family supports, other social supports, and increasingly the involvement of peer specialists or people who have been involved in the justice system and drug treatment who can help provide uh, support for people who are leaving short or long-term incarceration or residential treatment settings and help them with the transition to the community. Uh, and of course, we also want to include, as the last bullet on this slide shows, community monitoring and supervision, a focus on relapse prevention, because this is extremely important during the first 90 days after release from a custody setting or residential treatment setting, and also drug testing if possible. So, a uh, very important component to consider on the continuum of alternatives to incarceration. Now let me turn the program over to Michelle to conclude today's uh, webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. And if we could have, there we go. We have our next slide. So a few wrapping up comments. Um, we know that an hour is not long enough to learn everything you would want to know about ATI, and so we want to share some possibilities to continue working together to grow in your knowledge and also the application of your knowledge in your own countries. So ICADI was created as a project of the Colombo Plan Drug Advisory Program and launched as a global coalition priority at the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs in Vienna just uh, in March of 2024. And we're excited that we started off with 260 people welcoming us as an organization representing over 55 countries. Next slide. There we go. And uh, ICADI is really based upon three main pillars of support that we can offer. Uh, we want to partner with countries and colleagues that are in the exploration and development phase of ATI in your country. And we have a slide that will show you a little bit more about that but we will support you through all phases of development. For also your location to come for resources. So we have experts, we have a growing body of materials. We're a new organization, so we expect that to grow um, substantially over our next couple of years. And really this webinar uh, series is part of that resource function that we serve. And we also want to be a network. This is a lot of work and we don't want anyone to do this alone. So we're creating these opportunities, networking conversations uh, on a monthly basis for all of us to join together and to talk about what we're learning and what we're experiencing and what our ideas are in the ATI field. Next uh, slide. So we talk about country development. We know that happens in phases and you're all welcome to engage with ICADI regardless of what phase you're in. So some of you may find that you don't know much about ATI, but you're really interested in learning. And so the kinds of online education opportunities that we offer and some networking um, may be a good fit for you 
Um, and then we can also point you to resources that would help you supplement your education. Um, then some of you may be in phase two of development. Your country is interested in creating ATI, but maybe you don't know where to start or you don't know if you have all the systems in place that will be needed for ATI. So that in phase two, uh, we will be developing for later uh, release this year, a country self-assessment. So you can look at what some of those basic systems needs are um, and see where you stand and then make plans to bolster your system so you're ready to launch some kind of a pilot project. And that brings us to phase three. You are ready to plan and initiate and launch ATI. And there's an ATI policy leader training actually co-authored by the speakers in today's webinar. And we took uh, material and concepts from that training in a very shortened form to introduce you to ATI today. Uh, but it's a multi-day training. It involves action planning. And then there's a need for additional assistance to actually um, implement an action plan to collect the data and to tweak how you're implementing ATI to make sure it works. And then finally, the fourth stage is ATI expansion. So you have some experience in ATI. You may want to refine what you're doing, expand it geographically to other parts of your country, or even expand along that justice continuum, because ideally we want complementary initiatives of ATI available along that full continuum. Next slide. So how can you engage with us? Well, the first way is easy. You can uh, use this QR code or go to our website and click to receive our correspondence, essentially joining the ICADI network. There aren't any fees for this, and that's really the best way for you to stay in communication with our organization. Next slide. You can also continue to join our events online. So I mentioned we have the ATI Basics webinar series. We already have Why ATI, and that recording is available on our website. Um, this fundamental course is almost complete, but you will be able to reach the recording if you would like to share it with your colleagues, uh, and that will be posted shortly after the webinar. And then we have two more opportunities, substance use disorder treatment for individuals in the justice system, which will take place in July, and then again be recorded and posted for later viewing, and then the models of ATI, so an in-depth look at some of the things that we introduced to you today, and that will be in August. As I mentioned, we have monthly networking conversations. Uh, too often, a Q&A session at the end of a webinar really isn't enough time to have your questions answered, or do you have you share your experiences with ATI? So we want to create that community, and you'll see we have sessions for the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere with registrations on our website. And I already mentioned that we will be releasing a way to do a self-assessment um, for evaluating your systems for readiness for ATI. Next slide. I'll start talking. I know it's on, there we go. Um, we also have some in-person opportunities. So if you or your colleagues are going to be at the United Nations Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, that's taking place May 13, um, then please let them know that AT or that ICADI and our co-sponsors are going to have an ATI session, and we would love to see them there. We also will be at the ICEP and ICUDDR conference in Greece. So again, if you are there, please join us and have your colleagues join us. Uh, in addition to providing two subplenary sessions, we are also going to offer office hours for country delegations to have individual con uh, conversations about ATI. And next slide. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to working with you in the future. Feel free to reach out to me, um, and we're glad to connect you with any of the colleagues on the team or our global partners. Um, after this webinar, you will be receiving um, a Google form via email. We would love to hear about where you would like to continue your learning. There's also a link to that form in the chat box. And again, please register for the Eastern or Western Hemisphere networking discussions so we can learn more about how this looks in your country and how we can continue to work together. Thank you so much.